Good morning. You're very welcome to the third Heritage and Biodiversity Actions for Climate webinar organized by the Local Authority Heritage Officer Network. My name is Joe Gallagher and I'm chairperson of the Local Authority Heritage Officer Network. The network is a network of 31 heritage officers based in local authorities around the country and the Heritage Officer Programme is a collaboration between the Heritage Council and local authorities in Ireland. The Heritage Officer Network works in partnership to engage, educate and advocate for heritage. In this week's webinar, we're considering nature-based solutions for climate, and three of my Heritage Officer colleagues will be drawing on their experiences through the pollinator program in Kilkenny, the blanket bogs of Schlievenia, and the hedgerows of West Mead. I think we're all conscious of the biodiversity and climate emergencies that we face, and I think that today's webinar will suggest some of the ways in which we can play our part. I'm delighted to welcome Claire Cooper, Assistant Principal in the Science and Biodiversity Unit of the National Parks and Wildlife Service, who has kindly agreed to chair this morning's session. You're very welcome, Claire, and I'd like to hand proceedings over to you now. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I want to say that it's a pleasure for me to be here this morning, and thank you very much to the Heritage Officer Network for inviting me today. Um, I want to thank in advance the speakers that we have, uh, Shirley, Dervla and Melanie. Um, in the NPWS, we are very lucky to work with the Heritage Officer Network and the local authorities through our Local Biodiversity Action Fund, uh, which uh, allows local authorities or provides funding for local authorities to implement actions um, within their, their own communities. Um, and the, the local authorities with their reach into the community, they are really well placed, of course, as we know, to implement actions to restore biodiversity and ecosystem services. So today, as Joe mentioned, the topic is nature-based solutions for climate change. It's all about how we can harness the power of nature and work with nature, <coughs> excuse me, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce biodiversity loss and to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So as we know, protecting nature can store carbon and restoring it can draw greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere to help slow climate change. And there are, of course, plenty of other benefits, such as restoration of habitats uh, and species in water catchment areas can store water and stabilize soils. So nature-based solutions focus on protecting natural ecosystems and not just forests, but also peatlands and wetlands, as we saw last week with Deirdre's presentation on wetlands in Mayo and Amanda's presentation uh, on the Killon Bog project, um, but also grasslands and marine habitats. And doing this local, through locally led projects is, is especially important, which is why the connection with the Heritage Officer Network and the local authorities is very uh, vital to us. Um, Nature-based solutions encompass restoring degraded habitats, replenishing soil health through actions such as planting hedgerows and trees. And we're going to see more of this shortly on the presentation um, from Melanie. Um, it also encompasses bringing nature into towns and cities uh, with connected parks and creating ponds and helping pollinators. And Shirley is going to talk about this in just a moment. So just a little bit of housekeeping, as you would have heard at the start, um, the sessions are being recorded. Um, the presentations will be recorded and uh, question and answer sessions will not be recorded. Um, so with that and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dervila Ledgewidge. Um, Dervila is the Heritage Officer in Kilkenny County Council since 2003. She is the inaugural and current chair of the local authority uh, Tidy Towns and Pollinator Award Committee and she's proud to have supported Kilkenny County Council to be the first local authority to implement, to officially partner with the uh, All Ireland Pollinator Plan. Um, so uh, on that, uh, I'm going to hand over to you, Dervla. You can uh, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Can you see that okay? Yes, we can see that, Dervla. Thank oh, you. Sorry, I'm not at the beginning. Okay. I'm at the start now. So thanks very much, Claire. Thanks for the introduction. Um, as, as you said, I'm going to talk about the Kilkenny Pollinator Programme, which is a programme of actions that we as a local authority have been implementing um, for the last number of years. Um, and I want to focus on both what we do as a local authority in terms of our policies and how we manage our own land. But I also want to look at then how we're actually supporting communities on the ground who are also doing amazing work for pollinators. The value of pollinators um, is, and the threats to pollinators are very well document, documented in the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. We know that a third of Ireland's bee species are threatened with extinction. 
So why does this matter to us? Well, we also know that 75% of the global crops are pollinated by insects. A large portion of the plants, trees and shrubs around the world that we depend on to store carbon, which is increasingly important, are dependent on pollinators. And there's increasing scientific evidence to show the pollinators are being impacted um, by changes in climate. They're changing their migration patterns because of changes in weather patterns and the food sources that they normally go to are changing their seasonality and that's impacting them. So we need to support pollinators to help them because they also help us. And this slide is really just making the point that we can't um, look at climate change and the biodiversity loss in isolation. They are two parts of the same coin. Um, the question mark at the bottom is really to show that a lot of people are feeling a little bit overwhelmed, not knowing what they can do. And I hope that you'll agree by the end of this presentation that working with pollinators at a local level is something that all of us can do um, to help address in a small way the climate and the biodiversity crises that we're facing. So what do we actually do? Well, the framework for our plan is the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. And this um, is a strategic document developed by the Biodiversity Data Centre in 2015. And it's an all Ireland plan, and that is key to its success. And to date, there's more than 86% of Ireland's 42 councils have partnered on the All Ireland Pollinator Plan. So in Kilkenny, how we've approached it, obviously we use the framework of the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. We've established a, a committee, the steering committee, which um, we have various different departments within the local authority um, sitting on. And that's really important to get buy-in across the whole local authority. And then the other key part of our programme is that we work really closely with local communities on the ground, whether that's tidy towns groups, schools, uh, gardens and so forth. And this is our Bible. This is a guidance document produced by the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan as part of their suite of materials. And it identifies seven actions for local authorities to take to support pollinators. And I'm going to focus on just four of those here today and give you examples of what we're doing in Kilkenny. So the first one, and this is a key, is to protect what we already have. So as I said, we've set up our steering committee. We've developed new policies in our county development plan and in our climate adaptation plan to support pollinators. And then we've done some habitat surveys on land that we own. And the slide here is a photograph of um, a habitat assessment of a former landfill just outside Kilkenny City. Um, and the landfill was decommissioned back in 2010. And a couple of years ago, I commissioned an ecologist to do a habitat assessment and pollinator report on the landfill to identify the habitats were there and recommend ways in which we could manage that land better for pollinators. Um, we found, interestingly, a great species diversity, um, wetlands, um, grasslands, hedgerows and tree lines. And we came across quite a number of, of pollinators and we also found a, a lovely colony of bee orchids. Um, and that information then is going to inform the council going forward because the council is in the process of developing that landfill site up into a park. So the recommendations that we found from our pollinator report will help inform how that's managed. The next key area is mowing and Reducing the number of cuts of mowing and lifting the grass is really, really important to encourage um, native species flowering plants to keep growing in the grass. So this kind of uh, requires a mindset change in the uh, approach that we all will have taken in regularly cutting, leaving the, the grass cuttings on the ground. So we've had to shift a lot in how we manage this. Um, our parks department has just recently finished revising our grass cutting contracts um, looking at getting the contractors to take these, um, these issues on board. Uh, so we're starting a change in mindset and we've started to manage some of our roadside verges, embankments and some of our park areas. In some of them we cut on a six week rotation and in some of them we cut just once a year. And this slide here is an example of where in the Callan Moat Park, a new park we developed last year, 
Um, it's and the park actually it's an archaeological park in many ways because it's based on uh, centered on a moat site which was to, uh, set up in the 1200s by the Normans in just on the banks of the Kings River there in Callan and we've developed a beautiful public park there and key to the success of this park it's been managed for pollinators and a local farmer comes in once a year at the end of autumn takes one cut of silage and takes it away. And that is then helping to increase the biodiversity of the grasslands we have there for the pollinators. We do some pollinator planting as well. Um, that's an important way of raising awareness around pollinators. And the example here is the Peace Park in Kilkenny City on the banks of the River Nore. Raising awareness has been a key focus for us in the last few years when we were establishing the programme because we wanted to get as many people to understand what we were doing, why we were doing it and how they could come on board. We've taken out every year we have an annual uh, PR campaign on the local radio, in the local newspapers. We have had bee themed Paddy's Day parades, um, newsletters, workshops, training events. We've done a huge range of um, projects to bring the community on board with us and to raise awareness about why we need to be doing these, these actions. We also work a lot with schools and the photograph here shows two projects that I've worked with um, our colleagues in the Kilkenny Education Centre and the County Kilkenny Child Care Committee on providing evidence based curriculum based resources for teachers so that the teachers can be teaching the kids in the classroom about pollinators. We also do a massive amount of work with tidy towns and I should say tidy towns are leading the way in, in many cases in regards to pollinators and biodiversity. And my slide here is of the beautiful village of Inishtig in South Kilkenny, who were nominated to represent Kilkenny in Anton Floral in 2018. And the tidy towns were doing an amazing amount of work, but we also then decided to support them in the work they were doing by commissioning a number of pollinator studies. So we got we got a pollinator study of the local school um, and also of the village to identify areas where they could do more pollinator planting um, and manage their existing habitats for pollinators. I'm delighted to say that Entente, uh, the Inchtig got a gold medal in the Anton Floral and the judges actually commented in their adjudication report on the strength of their pollinator initiatives in, the, in their village. So that was really fantastic. Um, at a national level then as local authority heritage officers, we established, we saw the opportunity when the pollinator plan was launched to work more closely with our colleagues in the biodiversity data center. So um, we established in 2016 um, an award, a special award in the National Tidy Towns competition to support and encourage Tidy Towns groups to do more for pollinators. Um, over 200 Tidy Towns groups have entered the award since 2016. And last year, for instance, we had 55 groups, new groups who had never entered before. So we were really thrilled with that. And the photograph here is of Tullahocked Tidy Towns in Kilkenny and it's on the day when they got their award outside the Helix in Dublin uh, for being the regional winners on the Pollinator Award. They had previously successfully applied to us for an Agenda 21 grant because they wanted to do more work on pollinators and they used that grant uh, to employ an ecologist who worked with them then to help build up a pollinator plan um, and a strategic approach in the village of Tullahocked. So challenges and opportunities. The challenge is, is it's about changing a status quo. The days of having grass cut with the short back and sides are gone. We need to accept that we have to let the grass grow longer in certain areas. We need to reduce the use of pesticides. We've had to change a lot of our contracts. So we need, we as local authorities have to have a mindset change and the public has to have one too. Actually, in many cases, the public has already made that mindset change and is leading us to do more. Um, Just it's coming up to eight curve. minutes there, Dervla. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. It's a learning curve for us. And I wouldn't by any means say that we have everything perfect. We haven't. It's really at the start of a process for us and we are continuing to learn, but we are really trying our best to do what we can. The priority really is to protect the existing habitats. And that's a key point, I suppose, to take home around working with pollinators. Obviously, 
resources is always an issue and we don't have enough staff resources to do as much active work, face-to-face -face work with communities on the ground as we would like. In terms of opportunities then, obviously the pollinator plan has great benefits for biodiversity and climate action. The All-Ireland approach to this program is key to, to a, its success and I'd love to see more programs like this where there's an All-Ireland approach taken. Um, we really support positive local action and we're learning from communities as well and responding to them. Often it can end up with communities winning awards, getting money for the efforts they're done. So it can be a win-win situation for everybody. Um, and I do think that there's going to be a lot more work for future generations of ecologists, contractors, heritage officers, and um, people in this sphere. Nature-based solutions are here to stay. Um, so there is going to be more work in the future in this area. And I'd like to just, uh, finish up by saying thanks to all of our partners. We've, we really couldn't do this without it being done as a partnership project. So the success of what we've done so far is down to working in partnership across all of the different sectors. So thanks very much. Thanks very much for that, uh, Dervla. That was uh, really um, very, very interesting. And it's just great to see the local actions um, on the ground and how that, that has grown uh, over the years and the success that you've had with it. So well done and congratulations on that. Um, I'm going to move very quickly um, on to uh, Shirley. Um, so Shirley uh, Clarkin has almost 25 years experience working in the heritage and biodiversity sector in uh, as a heritage officer in Mon Monaghan County Council. Um, and she's worked previously with the Irish Wildlife Trust and with Antashka. Uh, she's a graduate of the University of Ulster DIT, the King's Inn and the IPA and UCD. And Shirley was a member of CORE, the National uh, Sustainable Development Partnership and was the first chairperson of the Natural, Her uh, the National Network of Heritage Officers uh, from 2017 to 2020. Um, so Shirley, um, without further ado, I'm going to pass uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the session over to yourself um, and if you can uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my screen? You can? I can, yeah, surely. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, oh, hang on. What am I doing? View from slideshow from beginning. Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that, guys. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about drain blocking on Sleeve Bay. And if you look at this map here, you can see the purple and the brown areas. That's the cross border area of Sleeve Bay covering three counties um, Fermanagh, Tyrone, and County Monaghan. And it's a 3,000 um, hectare area um, designated for nature, primarily blanket bog. And in 2010, Monaghan County Council, through a study that we did on ecosystem services benefits of wetlands, valued just the carbon portion of this bog to be worth 50 million euro. And that was back in 2010 using older methodologies. So a very important site, both for nature and for carbon as a carbon sink and for carbon sequestration. So what are peatlands then? Peatlands are made from the decomposed plant remains, primarily peat forming mosses and sphagna mosses that you can see here all in their colourful delights. And it's, they, they, there's an annual accumulation then of these sphagna remains into peat. And over time, the depth of peat deposit grows, obviously th over thousands of years. The water is retained in the peat and in the surface moss. There's an anaerobic um, conditions and then the organic matter stored there is a significant carbon sink. So they're both a carbon sink, a carbon store, and when they are not degraded, act as carbon um, sequestration. So they're very important for climate flood regulation and habitats obviously as well. So blanket bogs then um, are in upland areas. They're on plateaus, you know, usually, um, they're, and they're completely dependent on rainwater. So they would usually generally have no spring water entering them at all, unlike some raised bogs or fens, for example. And they're usually one to two meters deep. Um, Sleeve Bay, for example, is about 3.5 in some areas, so it can be quite deep. And they store mega amounts of carbon in there as peat, but they will start releasing greenhouse gases when they are degraded and when the anaerobic conditions are disturbed through drainage. And a healthy growing um, peatland must have its water table within 10 centimetres of the surface 
most of the year, so about 90% of the time. And of course, our peatland store in Ireland is extremely important as we have lost a lot of our um, peatlands, about 85% of them through drainage and obviously direct removal through previous economic decisions, I suppose, of the state and economic necessity. But times are changing now. We recognise them as having different benefits for society. So threats to blanket bog then include peat harvesting or turf cutting. So you can see here in the left hand side picture, um, a section of, air, of an area of sleep bay that's been dug out using an excavator actually for peat. Um, from peat erosion then, so um, exposed areas of peat like this can make their ways into water courses and ditches causing sedimentation and siltation, damaging nursery grounds for fish obviously and causing coloration in water making it harder to treat. Um, then we have unmanaged and unregulated burning. So that can be because people are trying to burn gorse or burn heather to create younger, younger growth for grazing. Or it can be simply that people throw cigarettes out of cars onto um, areas that are very dry. And then with wind and topographical conditions, wildfires can spread over large areas. Like you can see here on the right hand side, we had numerous fires in sea beds over the years, but that's a picture from last year where it spread over about 30 hectares very quickly and was contained by the fire service. Obviously overgrazing and undergrazing can cause impacts on blanket bog and then scrubbing up with trees and scrub and even self-seeded conifers from plantations that are nearby and then obviously a forestation as well affects blanket bogs. And why they're so important, as I said, they contain a lot of carbon, more carbon than tropical forests, by three times as much. 66% um, or 68% of Irish people get their drinking water from peatland catchments. And indeed on Steve Bed, the Tidavna Group Water Scheme, actually they get their water directly from the surface or from the top of the bog from one of the lakes there. And bogs prevent flooding as well because they can hold 20 times their own weight in water and obviously they're extremely important habitats for all of these sphagnum mosses, other types of mosses, the little butter burrs, the sundews, all the gorgeous photographs that you'll see on Tina Claffey's website and um, obviously all of the, the, the birds as well, so the wonderful dancing hen, harrier in the sky, the snipe and the red grouse, so absolutely amazing habitats. So water regulation then is extremely important. The sphagnum mosses can hold 10 times their own weight or in weight in water, trapped between the hummocks, but also in the cells themselves. And they have special barrel shaped cells, which allow the water to be sucked up into it like a sponge. And these barrel shaped cells, I've got them here, you can see them, they hold 10 times their, their, their weight in water. And if you're on a bog and you take up a handful of sphagnum moss and squeeze it, it's like standing over your kitchen sink with a big wet dishcloth and squeezing it out, you'll get tons of water which will pour out of it. And that just shows you the efficiency of sphagnum for holding water. And it draws the water right up into its tips. And so it can draw it right up from the water table surface right up. And that's really what you need to keep the peat forming, peat and up, uh, um, sequestering carbon. So we've been doing restoration works on the cross-border area of Sleep Bay over the last few years with funding through the Interreg project or Interreg funding, uh, cross-border funding. And this is one of the sites that we have um, put in some dams. So on the left-hand side picture here, you can see the map showing all of the areas where we needed to put in dams on this particular site. This site had been drained for um, a plantation which was then never put in because it was then deemed that it was uneconomical and not really worth a while to plant um, Sitka spruce which was planted adjacent to it um, in more modern times. So the green and the yellow indicate the priority and non-priority dams. So we put in the priority dams of peat and the ones surrounding the edge of this actual block. Um, so you can see here on the right hand side picture, one of the wide open drains and one of the new peat dams that have gone in. Um, so obviously you key out a little bit on either side of the drain itself and then insert a block of peat from an adjacent scrape um, into the dam to retain water. And you put these at intervals, you know, obviously by the, what the hydrologist said to do and based on um, guidance from the MPWS guidance and NIEA guidance in this case, because this is a cross-border site. And, um, and then this holds the water and starts to draw it back up to that 10 centimetre from the water tip from the surface of the bog again. And these grass over and vegetate over very quickly and the sphagnum moss actually starts growing. You can see it rising up and starting to grow at the surface very quickly thereafter. And you can see here on the left hand side, I know it's a grey day, it's often a grey day in these places, 
um, you can see the, the stacked series of dams in this particular drain. And um, so the bog slope in this area isn't great, but it would be steeper than maybe in some areas of a raised bog, for example, which some areas can be quite flat. So um, we're on a blanket bog, obviously, it's cloaking the top of the mountain, but we're lucky enough that it's a plateau. And then on the right hand side, you can see where the water has risen up in the drain that we're looking into a few months after the, the, the dams have actually gone in. And we've put in 2,200 peat dams um, on this site, improving 115 hectares of protected site. And obviously you have to use a big digger. So um, for the big digger lovers among you out there, here, here's one. And um, this wonderful excavator has specially adapted tracks on it. You can see them here. So they're plastic tracks, so they distribute the weight more evenly and they leave less pressure per inch on the surface of the bog. So thereby creating less damage on the site. So after a few weeks, actually, you can't really see where the, where the excavator has been. Um, and obviously this is a much more efficient way of doing peat dams on a large site than going out with the with the shovel and trying to do it, it would just be impossible. And um, so these um, experts, these operators have previously worked on sites actually removing turf from bogs in their previous life. And they've now become bog restorers and um, very skilled they are too at working on these very quaky surfaces, which are very difficult to operate in. And over the next year, we're going to be installing another 1,200 dams across 1.2 kilometres of drain length, um, covering another large area of hectare um, on the protected sites. So we're going to be doing the same process again on another site. Um, and so we hope again that this will work. Um, it should do, obviously. It's a straightforward enough process and it's amazing to see how nature itself responds once the structures are right, once the water isn't flowing off the bog down into the drains anymore, once it's retained at that surface level, how the, the bog starts to recover. And of course, it will take a number of years become a be before it becomes an effective carbon sink again, as well as being a carbon store. Um, but obviously getting the water in there is the very important first step. So this picture on the left hand side here, you can That's see one of the eight minutes now, Shirley, thank you. This is the last slide. Uh, thanks very much, Claire. Um, so you can see here on the left hand side, that's just one of the very shallow scrapes that the excavator has just dug out to you to get peat to fill in on the dams. And we have these around the bog now, but they actually fill in very quickly. They're not deep at all. You can walk through that. It's just a sort of a shallow puddle. And then the peat forming mosses um, gather into that again. So you use the, the material that's on site to actually restore the site. So you're not bringing materials in from elsewhere. And um, this is Dr. Rory Sheehan. He's been working with us on this project. He's um, the sleep SI coordinator. Um, and he says here, he's either very small or very far away. And I'll leave that up to you to determine. And then on the right hand side, then you can see one of our drains with the snow and the frost in it there last year and the peat dam in the distance that has been filled in. And so um, I invite any of you to come to see Bay Cross Border site to have a look at these um, dams at any time. And uh, we would love to be able to do more work like this in the future. It does create cost resources, obviously, for one peat dam, it costs about 34 euros. Um, per peat dam. So you can do the maths yourself to figure out how much that costs. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Shirley. That was really very, very interesting. And it is amazing to see the size of the machinery on, on the quaking surface, as you say, and how um, it, it, you know, it recovers so quickly, the, the weight is spread and uh, that the habitat recovers so quickly thereafter. And also to be using the natural peat dams as opposed to you know, plastic drain blocking, which might've been used in the past. Um, so thanks very much for that. And before I, I go on to Melanie with her presentation, I just wanted to remind everybody that we will have a question and answer session at the end. Um, so please, if you have any questions uh, so far for Dervla or for Shirley, um, if you can put them through on the, uh, the question and answer um, uh, a tab that is available there at the bottom of your, uh, your screen, uh, and we will have some time for questions at the end. So uh, I'm going to pass over in just a second to Melanie. Um, Melanie is the McQuaid, she's the Heritage Officer in Westmead County Council since 2017. And today she is going to talk to us about a project that produced two short films aimed at raising awareness about the importance of hedgerows for biodiversity and the potential for hedgerows to capture carbon. Um, so she is going to talk to us about how the project came about, the process of making the videos and uh, the key messages that were covered. So thank you, Melanie. 
Thank you, Claire. Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute there. <laughs> so yes, as Claire said, I'm going to talk about a project we did last year. We produced two uh, short films, the first entitled A View Over the Hedge, focusing on the biodiversity value of our hedgerows and the regulations concerning hedgerow management. And the second video focused again on hedgerow management, but with the emphasis on how our hedges can help to sequester carbon. So if I just can move my slide on. Bear with me. Yeah. OK, so the project came about really on foot of discussion at a heritage forum meeting where some of the forum members had expressed concern about inappropriate management of hedgerows. We decided it would be valuable to do an awareness raising piece in the form of a video. And this was done with funding from the Heritage Council with support from Westmeath County Council. The top image here shows James Ham. James is a farmer in Westmeath. He's also a member of the Hedge Laying Association of Ireland. And some of you may have seen James on Plan B, which was a documentary on TG Cahar about the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. James kindly agreed to work with us on this project and he allowed us to film on his farm. The lower image you'll see Therese Kelly. Therese is the National Parks and Wildlife Ranger for South West Meath and she's also a member of the Heritage Forum and Therese worked with us on the first video. Initially our plan was just to make one video but because hedgerows are such a wide subject and so important for biodiversity and in climate ad adaptation we ended up making two films and the second film uh, features Lillian O'Sullivan from Chagask and also uh, Mark McDill from the Hedge Laying Association and we were lucky to get some footage from the Hedge Laying competition that took place last year near Moat. Our hedgerows are cultural features. James makes a point in the video that uh, when we think of man-made structures we seldom think of hedgerows but that is essentially what they are. And most of our hedgerows were planted in response to enclosure acts back in the 17th century. So planting that occurred in the late 17th, 18th through to the 19th century uh, was mainly as a result of these enclosure acts. And a lot of the species planted then were hawthorn. But we have a lot of hedgerows across the country which are earlier in date, dating back many more hundreds of years, such as our historic townland boundaries. Hedgerows, of course, are important for the biodiversity. They provide an important food source in the form of flowers, nuts and berries. And hedgerows are an important habitat for a whole array of insects, birds and mammals. They act as corridors for these wildlife around our landscape, which is largely... Uh, so hedgerows provide a network connecting the habitats in what is otherwise a largely agricultural landscape. So the structure of a hedge then, of course, the main feature it will be the tree or bush species and pictured here are some of our native tree species and the most valuable hedge in terms of biodiversity will be a mixed species hedge uh, and one that has native species. A greater support, a greater, sorry, a greater diversity of species in our hedgerows will support greater diversity of fauna as opposed to for example a monoculture beach hedge or a non-native hedge like laurel, which has very little value for biodiversity. In fact, laurel uh, can be classed as an invasive species. Hedgerow habitat also includes the creepers, such as the honeysuckle and briar pictured here. And then as we move down the hedge, uh, important habitat to be found in the stone walls and earthen banks, which are associated with many of our hedgerows. These provide important habitats, not just for mammals, but also for our solitary bees. The wildflowers, of course, are also important for bees and other insects in the form of the nectar and pollen they provide. And not forget the dead wood and the leaf litter associated with our hedgerows, which again provide a food source for a variety of insects and microorganisms. So the whole thing, the hedgerow, is a habitat and it's an ecosystem in, in itself. And this image then uh, shows some of the ecosystem services provided by our hedgerows. And this is something that Therese discusses in the first video. Uh, one of the services not shown in this image is flood alleviation. So of course, flood alleviation and shelter will become more important as the climate continues to change. And as we experience more storm events and longer, hotter, drier summers. 
in, in the case of flood alleviation, our hedges play a vital role in that they can help to absorb surface water and help to control water flow. And then shelter, of course, is important. And in the video, James tells a story about uh, a neighbour of his who experienced a bad year and he uh, put it down to the lack of shelter, saying that there's not much shelter in an electric fence. And clearly our hedges can provide a lot more shelter than an electric fence with a hedge providing between 15 and 13 times its height in shelter. Then we discussed the legislation and regulations concerning our hedgerows. Under section 40 of the Wildlife Act, it is illegal to cut or destroy a hedge during bird nesting season. That is the 1st of March to the 30th of August. Under the Environmental Impact Assessment Agricultural Regulations 2011, an EIA is required for removal of 500 metres or more of hedgerow or where removal of hedgerow will create a field five hectares or larger in area. There will be cases where planning permission permits the removal of hedgerows to facilitate development. Often this, such conditions or such permissions will attach a condition for replacement planting of equivalent length of hedgerow and, and this is really valuable where it specifies that it's native species and species of local provenance. Exemptions, of course, to the regulations uh, include probably the most common being uh, health and safety on a roadside. So the second video um, focuses on carbon sequestration and how management of hedgerows can uh, impact on that. Um, Lillian O'Sullivan from Chagask outlines some of the work that she's been doing in Farm Carbon, a research project aimed at, aimed at calculating carbon sequestration and the capability of our hedgerows. <clears throat> so hedgerow management is important when we talk about biodiversity and climate adaptation and good management of hedgerows will benefit both. Hedgerows that are cut annually, uh, low and narrow to the ground, will have less benefit for biodiversity and for carbon sequestration. So bigger, taller, thicker hedgerows are, are best for both cases. If they're managed appropriately, our hedgerows can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So continuing on the hedgerow management, we looked at some of the traditional methods of hedgerow management and of course hedge laying. You can see here in the top slide hedge laying, hedge laying in action here and, and the recently laid hedge. And what hedge laying is, is basically cutting the stem but not severing it and then laying it over on its side. And that will allow new growth to come from the cut hedge. So we can see here in the lower slide, an example from James's farm. Coppicing is another traditional method of managing hedgerows, but that requires the full removal of the stem. And so new growth will just come from, from the stem. <clears throat> Some statistics in relation to hedgerows, and these vary, um, but there are between 300,000 and 680,000 kilometers of hedgerow in Ireland. It takes a hedge a long time to establish to its maximum biodiversity and carbon sequestration values. We're talking about 20 to 50 years. And I mentioned the carbon potential, the carbon sequestrant potential of a hedge, which will vary uh, depending on the size and age of the hedge, but it can be between 0 0.66 to 3.3 tonnes of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. So the key messages really are that the value of hedgerows uh, for biodiversity and climate adaptation are linked. It takes a long time to establish a hedge to its most beneficial for uh, biodiversity and carbon sequestration. So it's important that we manage the existing stock of hedgerow that we have. Um, the nature-based solutions, when we think of climate adaptation and our hedgerows, the nature-based solutions are in particular, flood alleviation, shelter and carbon sequestration. I finish by showing you the links to the two videos and encouraging you to have a look. Um, they cover these issues a lot better, I think, than I have. And also the last slide, just to give some further sources, sources and further information in relation to hedgerows. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Melanie. That was really very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that a lot of times people won't realise um, that hedgerows, you know, could can have uh, carbon sequestration uh, possibilities. You know, you, you would associate that more with, you know, peatlands that Shirley was speaking of earlier. Um, so that was really very interesting. Thank you. Um, just to, to remind everybody that the recording is now going to stop at this point. Um, and that we were are just about to open the floor um, for some questions. Uh, thanks again uh, to our um, panelists today, to Dervila, to Shirley and to Melanie. Um, some really insightful presentations and, um, you know, a lot of good work being done and a lot of progress being made and obviously a lot more to do, but um, certainly it's very hopeful um, to see that, you know, the, the local projects and local actions going on. Um, just to, to remind everybody that the recording will be sent to you uh, if you've logged on to the session through your email, a copy of the recording will be sent uh, through uh, to your email very soon and it'll be up on YouTube. And um, if you have got any questions in relation to any of the presentations that went on today, I think the best thing to do would be to contact in the first instance your own uh, heritage officer and your own local authority um, and, and, and take it from there. So with that, I am going to say thanks again to everybody. Thank you for having me and uh, I'm going to pass on to, to Joe. Uh, thank you, Claire. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you for attending this morning's webinar and for your questions and for your kind comments. I'd like to remind you that all the recordings of the webinars in the series are available online. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our contributors this morning, Dervla, Shirley and Melanie, for the case studies, the experiences and the insights that they provided. Thank you, Claire, for sharing uh, for chairing this morning's session. I'd also like to thank Catherine Casey, Shirley and Dervla for their hard work behind the scenes in producing these seminars. Just to remind you that the fourth and the final webinar in the current series of Heritage and Biodiversity Actions for Climate webinars will take place online next Thursday, February the 17th at 9.30 a.m. when we'll be exploring the theme of people, heritage and climate. We look forward to seeing you then. Good morning. <laughs>